less, mm, less drunk. Following up on the video that just posted a couple of days ago that went over the best endings in the Super Nintendo library, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum with the worst endings. Now, by worst endings, I don't mean the worst games. That's already its own list. I mean, yeah, Pit Fighter's gonna have a crappy ending because Pit Fighter sucks. That's too easy. I'm referring to games that might be halfway decent or at least worth playing today that may have endings that are either head-scratchingly odd or just incredibly unsatisfying, or in some cases, downright infuriating. Just like the best endings list, you can still watch this video if you want to avoid spoilers. I'm using the same spoiler system here, so even if you don't want certain endings spoiled, just skip ahead in the videos by watching the arrows below that show you where to click on the time bar, or you can just use the timestamps in the video description. 13. Incantation. Here's a game that might fool some of you because it looks fantastic, the movements are fluid, the sprite work is great, and the backgrounds look really good. But don't kid yourself, this game is completely half-assed. Other than the visual design, Incantation is a completely half-assed game, and look no further than the ending for proof. But if you'd rather find out the hard way, skip to 137 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. This is your ending. This screen, right here, that's it. Thank you for defeating the evil wizard. We will always be grateful to you and hope that you will stop by and visit us again. Or sorry, AGAIN! There's like three freaking exclamation points there. They didn't even bother to properly center the text for God's sake. This would be expected if it were an NES game in 1986, but not an SNES game 10 years later. 12. Smartball. Alright, we're getting some better games here. Not that Smartball is all that good, but it's a perfectly okay platformer that's decent for killing an hour or two. But the weird thing about this game is, the western localization completely cut out the dialogue along with a bunch of cutscenes. There's still an ending here, but it doesn't make any sense at all. So if you play this one, play the Japanese edition titled Jerry Boy. Skip to 227 to avoid any spoilers. Ready? Okay. You turn back into a human and meet this girl, I guess. But then this other guy comes in and drops to his knees sobbing. Uh, what? In the Japanese version, that explains that one brother is jealous of the other and hires a wizard to turn him into a ball of jelly. And the ending is one brother defeating the other. But in the US version, you get nothing but vagueness, confusion, and ambiguity. Eleven. R-Type 3. I love this game, it's one of the very best shoot-em-ups on the Super Nintendo, and it's definitely one of the toughest challenges. Some of the level design and art direction here is absolutely top-notch, but when it comes to the ending, well, that's a different story. Skip to 317 to avoid what I guess would be considered spoilers. Ready? Okay. So you beat the final boss, and almost immediately, the credits roll. That can't seriously be it, right? Okay, maybe this is like Contra 3, where you have to beat it on hard. Nope! You get a slightly closer view of your ship, and it blasts off toward whatever planet this is. Look, I'm not looking for an insanely intricate story in a shoot-em-up, but just give me a little more satisfaction than just some credits and a THE END screen. How about some stats or a shooting percentage or something? Oh well, this is still a great game, just a complete letdown of an ending. 10. Jiku Oshaberi Parodius. This is another great shoot 'em up playthrough that's even more ambitious than R Type 3. It's the third Parodius game for the Super Nintendo, and it never left Japan. And it's one of the most technically impressive games ever made for the system. I mean, an old Japanese man spends the entire game shouting at you. How can you not love that? This game is absolute insanity, but again, we have a disappointing ending. Skip to 401 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. So, you beat the final boss, you open up a door behind it, and you get blown up, and the credits roll as you float up to heaven, presumably. That's it? Yep, that's it. Again, this is a fun playthrough, but that ending is a major letdown. Nine. Rival Turf. Yeah, this is just a typical beat-em-up, a Final Fight clone no less, but it's a perfectly decent game that can support two players. Not a terrible playthrough, just average. But the ending, oof. Before I get to spoilers, I have to mention, if you want to play this one, play the Japanese version titled Rushing Beat. You're much better off. Skip to 449 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. You beat the final boss, but not before he does a James Bond villain type speech about how this isn't even his final form and he... Wait, what the hell just happened? Yeah, I don't think I want to know where he put that fist based on that reaction. And that's it. That's the ending. Meanwhile, Rushing Beat, if you play it with an English patch, is completely different. You get this Maria character involved, and it turns out this dude is your father? Sure, okay, whatever. It's still better than that awful ending we got here in the States. Eight. Plock. 
I just did a video on this one recently, and it's a very good platformer that has a lot going for it. I mean, you play as a character that throws its limbs at enemies, you gotta love that. And the soundtrack here is freaking incredible. One of the flaws this game has, however, is the brutal difficulty, and that plays into how disappointing this ending is. Skip to 545 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. So you finally bust your ass and beat this giant queen flea thing while strapped to these annoying spring boots that make you jump around whether you want to or not, and you have to dodge these other smaller fleas and these frustratingly slow projectiles that stay on screen seemingly forever. It's a really tough boss fight, and if you finally triumph, you're rewarded with Locke falling asleep in a chair. That's it. Well, he does try and keep himself awake, I guess. Maybe he's just really hammered and he needed to switch to Irish coffee or something. At least the music here is awesome, but man, after such a tough game, that ending is a disappointment. Seven. Star Trek The Next Generation Futures Past. This game is actually really ambitious. It attempts to play out like an episode of the TV show would, which involves a lot of different gameplay modes. Some of it works and some of it doesn't. The user interface is pretty outdated and the top-down action stuff is a bit clunky, but managing the ship, seeing the bridge, and interacting with everyone is kind of cool. The ending, however, left a bit to be desired. Skip to 657 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. The story revolves around a conflict with the Romulans and the discovery of an integrated field de-randomizer. In other words, a thing that can reshape matter and energy in some weird way, I guess. It turns into a big race to see who can get to the thing first, and it turns out that this thing was just recently discovered because the previous race that had it had to send it 10,000 years into the future because it was too easy to abuse or something. So Picard ends up with it, decides himself that it's still too powerful for anyone to use, and uh, somehow instructs the thing to send itself another 10,000 years into the future. Oh, come on, you're just passing the buck. What is that? Not that the story is all that riveting. It's just a total cop-out ending combined with a deus ex machina of telling the thing to go play with itself for another 10,000 years. What a crock. Six. Spider-Man and Venom Separation Anxiety. This is the sequel to Maximum Carnage, which is a much better game, but this one is still okay, and it's two-player co-op as well, which is always a plus for a beat-em-up. Skip to 737 to avoid spoilers of the ending of this one. Ready? Okay. So this is supposed to be a sequel, right? So why does this game have the same freaking final boss as the first game? And it's not even a Mega Man type thing where it takes a different form, it's just Carnage again. whoop de doo also, just like a lot of other games on this list, you get a single screen as your ending. Such a ripoff. At least the Maximum Carnage game had a few comic panels and dialogue and stuff, and this is just nothing. Five. Top Gear. Yeah, I know, I'm upset to see this game here too. I freaking love Top Gear. It's one of my favorite Super Nintendo games ever, and it may be an unpopular opinion, but I like it a heck of a lot more than F-Zero. But maybe the game's biggest flaw is how it ends. Skip to 818 to avoid Top Gear spoilers. Ready? Okay. This is the screen you get when you complete a circuit and qualify for the next country. This is the screen you get when you complete the game. This is the screen you get when you complete the game on hardest difficulty. They didn't even bother to make an ending for this one. Also, what is with the champagne bottle here and where he's holding it? Looks like he's having a tug of war with Cyclops and Cyclops is starting to cry. Four. Mega Man Soccer. The idea behind this game is great. It's the same spirit behind stuff like Mario Golf or Mario Tennis. It's just not executed all that well, and one big reason is that the game was never totally finished before it was released. Skip to 901 to avoid quote-unquote spoilers. Ready? Okay. This game doesn't even have an ending. Okay, technically it does, but you have to play the game through an action replay to, and enter a code to be able to see it. But yeah, when you play the game normally, if you finish a tournament or a league, you just go back to the title screen. It's seriously weird how the ending is obviously there, they just neglected to program it to show when it's supposed to. That's not even half-assed, that's like quarter-assed. Three. Seventh Saga. Again, the ideas behind this game are really strong. It's a turn-based RPG where you pick one out of seven different characters and you're all searching for the same stuff, with the other six characters playing out their quests controlled by the computer AI. It's also brutally difficult and easily the toughest RPG on the Super Nintendo. So just to get near the end of this game is a struggle. And what are you rewarded with? Skip to 945 to avoid spoilers. Ready? Okay. You beat the final boss, the king thanks you and says you'll be reborn as his descendant, the credits roll, the end. It doesn't matter who you finish the game with, all seven characters all get the same crappy anticlimactic ending. All that grinding and misery and suffering for that. This sucks. Two. 
Super Ghouls and Ghosts, another notoriously difficult game, and the sequel to another notoriously difficult game for NES. If you manage to beat this one, you are legit. Skip to 1057 to avoid the infuriating spoilers. Ready? Okay. The final boss transforms into its final form, you kick his ass, and then... No, no, they didn't really do this, did they? They copied the same format they used for the original NES game. That's right, you gotta go all the way back to the beginning and beat the game again. Ugh. And in addition to that, the second time around, you have to use this weapon called the Princess Bracelet to defeat the final boss. And I'm not kidding when I say it might be the worst weapon in the game. Yeah, it's powerful, but its range totally sucks, so it takes twice as long to get through the final stage, which brings the time limit into play, and that's never fun. Just getting the Princess Bracelet is a pain in the ass, since you have to get more than halfway through the last stage in full armor, meaning you can't take a hit, so you can get to the right treasure chest to get it. But yeah, I can't begin to tell you how pissed off I was the first time I played through this. I mean, I thought Super Nintendo games were supposed to be improvements on NES games. Why did they repeat the same dumb structure? Ugh, it just drives me insane. One. Super Fire Pro Wrestling Special, thanks to TwistC from the SNES Drunk Discord, as well as Justin Wang for pointing this one out. There's a link to Justin's channel in the video description. Yeah, this may be a mere wrestling game, and it never left Japan, but it's got the most messed up what the hell did that really just happen ending in any game I've seen. The story itself is messed up. When you play through career mode, your coach drops dead out of nowhere, and you accidentally kill your friend in the ring. To skip spoilers for the ending, just stop the video right now. Ready? Okay. You eventually make your way up to a world title match against the one and only Dick Slender, otherwise known as this game's way of avoiding paying to use the likeness of Ric Flair without actually calling him Ric Flair. To prepare for this match, Dick Slender murders your tag team partner in the ring and then tells you he was the one who killed your coach. What? Seriously? It gets better, and by better I mean worse. You win the match, you're the new world champion, and you go home, and you kill yourself. Yes, you heard that right. You're so unfulfilled by this victory because your friends are all dead, so you just decide to end it all. What in the blue hell kind of an ending is that? It's a freaking wrestling game, for God's sake. However, I do need to point out that the primary brain behind this game is none other than Goichi Suda, otherwise known as Suda51, who also made games like No More Heroes and Killer7, and this was one of his first games. So congratulations, Suda51, for creating one of the most out-of-nowhere, what-the-hell-am-I-actually-watching endings of any game ever. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.